Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm here with another A-level chemistry exam question walkthrough. This time I'm going to be looking at pH curves and indicators. As I work through the question, I will write down my thoughts about the background for the question in blue and the answers that are going to get you the actual marks will be in green. If you want to download the questions as a PDF, that's in the description. Otherwise, let's head on in. Before we answer these questions, it's worth just clarifying two important definitions, and they are equivalence point and end point. The equivalence point is the point in a chemical reaction where you have added chemically equivalent quantities of each of the reactants. So typically that might be equal moles of one chemical as another. So in an acid-base titration, you've reached neutral. If the coefficients are, say, one to two, you won't have added identical moles of the two reactants, but you will have added equivalent amounts of the reactants to mirror the coefficients in the equation. So twice as many moles as one chemical as another, for instance. Whereas the end point is the stage in a titration where your indicator changes colour, or if you're not using an indicator in a redox titration, where there is a colour change. Now, for a titration to be effective, the equivalence point and the end point need to coincide. And that's at the heart of all of the questions that we're going to look at today. So, if we take a look at these questions, we can see that we've got four pH curves that we need to recognise. And so, I would recommend that you kind of skim through them and think, OK, we're starting at pH 3 in the first one. So that is a weak acid and we're finishing at pH 12 or 13. That's definitely a strong base. pH 1 is a strong acid and then that's still a strong base and that's a strong acid, weak base. And then this time we're starting with a strong base and we are finishing with a strong acid. And so what we're doing in part A of this question is we're taking a look at these combinations of chemicals, deciding which one must have been in the conical flask and which in the burette, and then which curve that matches up to. And so in the first one, we've got ammonia, which is a weak base, and that is being added to the hydrochloric acid. So that means that hydrochloric acid is down in the flask and ammonia is up here, which we, means we're going to be starting at the pH of a strong acid and finishing at the pH of the weak base once we've added an excess of ammonia, which means that the answer is curve C. And then similarly, we're moving on in the second question, we're adding sodium hydroxide, so that is in the burette, and that's being added to ethanoic acid in the conical flask. So we're starting with a weak acid pH, and this is the only weak acid that there is, and so it must be curve A. Remember, ethanoic acid as a carboxylic acid is definitely a weak acid. And then last of all, we're this time adding nitric acid, a strong acid, from the burette to 25 cm cubed of sodium hydroxide, which is the strong base. So that's why we've got these two curves, D and B. They're both strong acid, strong base combinations, but we are adding the acid from the burette to the sodium hydroxide. And so we're going to be finishing at an acidic pH, which is going to be D. This question then goes on to take a look at four different indicators and the pH range over which they change their colour. Or to say it differently, the end point that these indicators can coincide with. And so when you are selecting an indicator for a particular titration, you need to make sure that the pH range coincides with the rapid pH change that occurs at the equivalence point of a titration. And so, for instance, they're asking us to select from the table an indicator that can be used in the titration that produces curve B, but not curve A. And so what we need to do is we need to take a look at the differences at the equivalence point. So the equivalence point is taking place here on both of curve A and curve B, and the pH change in that region is quite big for curve B. It's anything between about four and about 10. And so when we are selecting an indicator for curve B, we need to pick one where the color change coincides with between four and, in fact, it looks more like perhaps three and 10 or middle 3.5 and 10. 
And so what we've got here is we've got two different options that we could pick from. We could pick Cresol Purple that definitely changes colour within, within that region in the sort of 7.6 to 9.2 sort of range. So it changes colour about there. And we've also got Bromo Cresol Green, which I think changes colour at the very bottom of that graph between 3.8 and 5.4. Whereas when we take a look at curve A, that colour change is from about 6 and a bit, maybe 6.5, up to again about 10. And so on that occasion, the Cresol Purple would fall in this range again, and the Bromo Cresol Green falls way too low for the equivalence point, the rapid pH change that we get at the equivalence point. And so what we can see is that Bromo Cresol Green is no good, for curve A, it would be for curve B. And so Bromo Cresol Green is the correct answer for B part one. Incidentally, neither of the other two indicators are appropriate answers here because they won't work for either pH curve because both of the endpoints for those indicators fall outside the pH change at the equivalence point for both of the pH curves. Then the question says, give the colour change at the end point of the titration that produces curve D when Cresol Purple is used as an indicator. And so Cresol Purple has got two colours. It's got yellow and purple. And so we are saying what the colour change is when that indicator changes colour. And so what we need to note is that we're starting high. And so the Cresol Purple at the beginning of the titration will be purple and then it will still be purple, still be purple, still be purple. Then we get that rapid pH change and it drops to about pH two and a half, three. And so it will change from purple to yellow. When you've been asked for the color change, you must say both of the colors, the starting color and the finishing color. This next question is really similar at the beginning to the first. This is for good practice. So we've got four curves again. We're adding one thing, which will be where the final pH will lie. And then we're adding it to a different thing and that will indicate what the pH should be at the beginning. So we're adding sodium hydroxide, strong base, so high finishing pH to ethanoic acid, a weak acid. So it will start at the weak acid pH and finish at the strong base pH, and that is curve G, because that is the only one that starts at about three at the beginning. And then secondly, we're adding ammonia, a weak base, so that means it will be a medium to high finishing pH, about nine perhaps, and we're adding it to hydrobromic acid, which you won't come across very often, that's HBr, that's likely to be a strong acid. Let's see if there's any confusion in there. We've got a weak base finishing pH, no there's, no, there's no two options. There is only this one that finishes at a weak base pH around about nine or 10. So that answer has to be curve F. And last of all, we're adding hydrochloric acid, which we know is a strong acid, to potassium hydroxide, which we know is a strong base. And once again, they've given us two similar options, but the important thing is that there's a strong acid is being added from the burette to the strong base in the conical flask, which means it will start at the strong base pH, which means it's going to be curve H, which finishes very low for the strong acid. And then we've got similar questions again, but with a, a little twist later on about the four pH curves. We've once again been presented with four indicators and we've been shown the pH change that they have and the end point that we want that to coincide with for our titration. So first up, which indicator in the table could be used for the titration that produces curve E, which means that we need something again in the region of about three and a half to 10 and a half, maybe as, maybe as high as 11, but it will not work for curve F. So this time let's do it in reverse. Let's look for what's missing from curve F is this high pH region at the equivalence point. And so we want to choose something that has got a pH change at equivalence of greater than about seven. And so the appropriate one here is Cresol Purple, which has got the color change of 7.6 to 9.2, because that would be completely inappropriate for curve F, because it would change color after the equivalence point has been reached. Whereas this one, it would change color at the equivalence point because it coincides.
And the next question asks us for the colour change for curve H when we use naphthyl red. So curve H starts at a high pH, and so the naphthyl red will be its yellow colour. And then once we reach equivalence, it will rapidly drop to about pH 2, and the naphthyl red will go red. Again, both colours needed to get this mark. And then the final part of this question says that we've got a beaker with 25 cm cubed of a buffer with a pH 6. Two drops of each of the indicators are added to the solution. State the colour of the mixture in this buffer solution. Assume that there's no reaction taking place, so it is literally a mixture of the colours. And so, systematically, the pentamethoxy red at pH 6 will be in the high pH colour, so that will be colourless. And then the naphthyl red will be, again, its high pH colour, so that will be yellow. The 4-nitrophenol actually changes colour at pH 6, so that will be in the process of changing colour from colourless to yellow. So this will either bring us colourless or yellow. And then the cresol purple will be its low pH colour because it doesn't change colour until the pH reaches quite a high 7.6. So we will still have the yellow from cresol purple. So all four of those colours, when we add them together in one big beaker, will give us a yellow colour because we've got two definite yellows and two colourless. This final question takes a slightly different approach because it is asking us how we actually generate the pH curves that we've been looking at for the previous two questions. So first up it tells us that you need to use a pH meter to generate this curve and it asks us to explain why calibrating that pH meter is really important to improve the accuracy of the pH measurement and quite simply pH meters get less accurate over time and so what you end up having to do is calibrate them either by putting them into a buffer solution then adjusting the pH reading on the actual meter maybe with a screwdriver or something like that or you plot a calibration curve where you again use three buffer solutions or more and you just use that to adjust any pH meter readings that get displayed when you're actually doing the readings yourself. But that's not what's being asked about here, but that question is sometimes asked. And so we're being asked how we would do the actual titration itself. And so the idea is that in the conical flask, we've got our carboxylic acid, 25 cm cubed, and the sodium hydroxide would be in the burette. And so what we would do is we would measure the starting pH of the acid, we would then add the alkali from the burette in known portions, anything from 1 cm cubed to 2 cm cubed. And with each addition, we would need to stir the mixture or swirl the mixture to make sure the reaction had been thorough. Then we'd measure the pH after the addition. Then we would repeat, and then we'd measure the pH, etc. Keeping repeating until that alkali is in excess. So given that they're the same uh, concentration, the excess should be reached at anything at about 27 cm cubed. But as we saw from those pH curves in the previous questions, typically excess is considered to be 40, 50 cm cubed. But really anything between 27 and 50 is fine. And then that's actually five separate bullet points, which would get us all five of these marks. But for a sixth possible option, we could say that we would make sure that as we near the end point, we would add the alkali in smaller increments, typically 0.2 cm cubed or really anything between 0.1 and 0.5 cm cubed. And so what we know from the question is that we've got five marks available. I've given us six possible bullet points that we could use. And this is the sort of question which would say, any five from this list. And it would have some extra advice, such as making sure that the answer was in a logical sequence and making sure that you'd talked about the correct use of the equipment and that you'd talked about the correct equipment overall. If you weren't talking about using a burette and a pH meter, then you're unlikely to get any marks for just kind of going down the wrong pathway for the question. Okay, that's the end of that question. That's the end of this video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.